The internet has spoken. These points are so sh- <gasps> I honestly hate hearing about how the controls sucked. No, they didn't suck. You sucked at them! And gamers these days are spoiled. Colin P. Isn't Colin P just poop? <laughs> Had to end up disliking since you didn't seem to know much about the series. Hashtag sad. So sad! Dislike! <laughs> That's right, the internet obviously wants to know my exaggerated negative opinions on video games. With that said, welcome to Dumb Candy Games, Yum Candy, Bad Candy once again. In this series, we take a look at great games with some serious flaws. Bond. James Bond. A small, inexperienced team at Rare created what was the best first-person shooter on consoles at the time, and what ended up being the third best-selling N64 game of all time. It's hard to overstate the masterpieceness of this classic 20-year-old game. I mean, geeks on the internet have made hours of content about this game. I mean, look at this guy. But as classic as it is, it's also rife with bad candy. Let's look at the top 007 terrible aspects of 1997's GoldenEye 007 for the Nintendo 64. Number 7. Obscure Objectives. Let's kick this off with a softball. The objectives in some of the missions on higher difficulties were often pretty obscure. Switching the Surface console off rather than destroying it, sticking this modem onto this particular monitor in conjunction with activating the mainframe in the room below, it was often just simply hard to understand what to do, especially for new players. Of course, I will say this point is mitigated somewhat by actually reading the freaking mission briefing, in which you would get clues or instruction on what to do. Even so, it could be unclear. Number 6. Ooh. The controls. Since I've been playing this game since it came out, it's hard for me to criticize the controls, but other people do it a lot. Yeah, for some reason the control style is really hard for a lot of people to go back to. Not to mention the N64's controller was always a little weird. Oh, now this makes sense. I will point out the plethora of forward-thinking options that Rare provided for controlling the game, however, including a few two-controller options for dual analog stick gameplay. My biggest gripe here, though, is that crouching is such a complex task. Hold aim, then hold down C. Then to move while crouched, you release aim first, then C down. This complex maneuver forces you to stop moving before crouching, and in general, it makes ducking behind objects for cover a non-starter. Also, if you wanted to crouch while holding the zooming sniper rifle, good luck. To even pull this off, you have to start with a different weapon. That's why in Perfect Dark, the sniper's secondary is crouch. No, don't bother fixing the controls, just add a secondary or something. Number five. Stealth. Stealth in GoldenEye was one of its selling points at the time. There were a couple of silenced guns you could use, in addition to slapping people or using throwing knives to sneak around maps. But stealth in this game is an illusion. Equip a KF7, for instance, and single shot it using the aim button, and that's just as good as having a silencer. This is because the enemy alert mechanic is based on a timer, so if you space your shots by enough time and resist rattling them off rapid fire, enemies will not be alerted. All right, so I'm just gonna quietly take out this camera. Not that GoldenEye claims to be realistic or anything, but just think about it. The loud shots, the sound of reloading, enemy gunfire, none of that stuff matters in this game's stealth mechanics. Let's extrapolate this to the real world. That checks out though, right? Which brings me to number four, stupid enemies. The AI, while groundbreaking for the time, is dumber than a tree stump. Not only are they oblivious to loud weapons as stated before, but they have a critical blind spot. Actually, a couple of them. They can't see through glass or over railings. 
Surfaces like these appear like solid walls to the enemies, so maps like the caverns play out super easy. These catwalks are safe havens for Bond. Any enemy utilizing an explosive weapon should not be trusted. They tend to be extremely self-destructive and don't seem to understand that explosions are bad. That is a problem. Back off a little bit. Not only that, if you stand super close to an enemy, they typically can't shoot you. This should be the easiest shot for an elite soldier, and yet... Possibly the worst point about the enemies are the elite body armored guys that apparently also have armored... faces? I guess it's just the way that the math works out. Then again, maybe this is a commentary on how brainless they are. Number three. Odd job. No comment. Number two. Multiplayer. It's commonly known these days that programmer Steve Ellis single-handedly created GoldenEye's multiplayer not only incredibly quickly, but just a few months before the game's launch, and totally unauthorized and under the radar of both Nintendo and Rare. And while I'm about to criticize this mode, understand that this man is a goddamn hero. I, am the one, the way you're done, the I have probably put untold thousands of hours into this mode over the years, and as fun as it is, it feels like what I just described an anemic game mode that was rushed out and tacked on at the last second. There are a handful of unique maps, but the maps ported over from the main game have been stripped of detail and interactive objects, and have also been cut down dramatically. The weapon loadouts are interesting, but not customizable and hardly comprehensive. What's worse is that they don't randomize. Your weapon of choice will always occupy the same slot, as will any secondary weapon. The body armor is often far too easy to hoard, and in maps like the temple, it's far too easy for a single player to camp the map's single suit of armor, which sits at the end of a dead-end hallway. To top all this off, the mode almost breaks the console. Playing four-player through a tiny 160 by 120 postage stamp window is difficult enough, but additionally the mode runs at a horrendous frame rate. It's quite common for four-player matches to dip below 10 frames per second, killing almost any sense of fluidity in the controls. Which brings me to number one, the terrible frame rate. Though the game targets 30 frames per second, typical frame rates hover around the mid-teens to low 20s, but this is a fragile state. In particularly busy scenes, such as lots of enemies, lots of explosions, or lots of players in multiplayer, the frame rate can easily dip below 10 frames per second. <laughs> It also varies from mission to mission, as some environments like the silo run reasonably well, while others like the jungle crawl in the low teens. And that's when nothing particularly exciting is happening. In the few instances when you do get a solid 30 frames per second experience, it is absolutely divine. It's a glimpse of what the game could have been if it had been optimized better, or if the N64 had more power, or if it would be re-released today for modern hardware. Automatics dump their magazines in a few seconds, the animations are crisp, and the control is responsive. Of all the problems in this game, a zippy frame rate would go a long way towards making this palatable for a modern audience. So far so good though, I'm amazed that I haven't had any... <laughs> I was gonna say major incidents. <laughs> GoldenEye obviously remains one of my favorite games of all time, and one that I still love playing and can play very well today. But even it isn't safe from modern standards and attitudes of how video games should play. And you know what? That's okay. I think at some level we can all agree our nostalgic favorites are imperfect games, maybe even terrible games from a modern perspective. But as human beings, we each have our own tastes and values, not to mention memories and histories with these games, so it makes sense that our subjective experiences can be so beautifully varied across the board. Flipping the switch on a console and hitting start on the controller is the only way these games can come to life in any meaningful sense, as electrical impulses ebb and flow through our synapses in time with the cascade of electrons through the cartridge. Our conscious experiences of these collections of algorithms and artwork are as much a part of this cosmos as our galaxy, or our planet, or ourselves. But the controls in Tomb Raider really are hot f***ing garbage. And that's it for today's Yum Candy Bad Candy. As always, let me know what great games you think have serious flaws in the comments below. Before I end today, I wanted to add some shout outs here to sort of support a few other content creators. You know, YouTube used to have this video response feature, but that's long gone. 
And with the way the algorithm's been working for the last couple of years, I think it's always good to direct people to content they might not be aware of. I'm constantly finding good content on smaller channels that I really should have known about way, way sooner. So uh, first off, if you saw my first Bad Candy video about Tomb Raider and are into Tomb Raider content, uh, you should definitely check out the Brotherhood of Gaming guys. They do a ton of Tomb Raider stuff, plus streaming speedruns with commentary. I actually found these guys about a year before doing my Tomb Raider video, and I was pretty impressed with their speedrunning content. Funny enough, we got into it a little bit on the comments of my video, so they, they probably hate Don't Kenny Games, but what can you do? Anyway, obviously they are big Tomb Raider fans, so definitely check them out. Another channel I only discovered last year, around the time I did my big GoldenEye livestream, is R White Goose. This guy is an OG GoldenEye speedrunner and knows, you know, not only all the glitches and tricks of speedrunning the game, but he knows the history of the people behind the runs, you know, how they got them, uh, what methods were discovered and when they were discovered, and he presents all this information in these really surprisingly entertaining long-form streams that he does on Twitch. Even though it's one of my favorite games of all time, I've never really been interested in speedrunning GoldenEye. I just find it too frustrating. But these videos are super interesting to watch, so definitely check him out. And one more to check out, especially for GoldenEye content, is Sober Dwarf. Uh, this guy's design documentary for GoldenEye was posted last year, right around the 20th anniversary of the game, and it's just packed with really great information. He puts the game into its historical perspective in a really great way. He reveals all kinds of development lore. Um, it's just really good, and it only has around 5,000 views as of this writing. Um, and then as a channel, he's only got around 4,000 subscribers, too. For no other reason, probably, than he was a little late to the game. So show these guys some love, and let's support some of these small YouTubers. Uh, and thank you very much for supporting this small YouTuber by watching Dome Candy Games, because video games are like candy for your dome.